These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythms, get down. Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, Kumina Queen, a film by Niasha Lang. Africa World Now Project is next. According to Kamal Brathwaite, Kumina is the most African of the cultural expressions to be found in Jamaica with a negligible European or Christian influence. Linguistics evidence cites the Congo as a specific ethnic source for the language and possibly the music of Kumina. There are varying theories as to whether it was brought with late African arrivals after emancipation or whether it was rooted in Jamaica from the 18th century and deepened by later African influence. Kumina is to be found primarily in St. Thomas and Portland and to a lesser extent St. Mary, St. Catharines and Kingston. Kumina ceremonies are usually associated with wakes and tombments or memorial service but can be performed for a wide range of human experiences, births, thanksgivings, invocations for good or evil. Kumina sessions, some extending 21 days, involve singing, dancing and drumming and are of two general types. Belo, the more public and less sacred form of Kumina, at which time songs are sung mainly in Jamaican national language and country, the more African and serious form, and at which time mounting usually occurs. The journey of the spirits from the ethereal to the mundane world is no less ritualized than other Kumina elements. Once invoked by music and other ritual tools, such as but not limited to rum, candles, leaves, the spirits are said to hover near the dancing booth. If successfully enticed, they travel down the center pole into the ground, then through the open end of the drum to the head of the drum where the drummer and the queen must salute their presence. The spirit then re-enters the ground from where it will travel up the feet of the person selected to be a vessel along the whole length of the body culminating with the full possession in the head of the transforming individual. Recounting a personal experience with Imogene Kennedy also known as Queenie, who was a queen and traditional bearer of Kumina, James Early in his article, The Recommunalization of a Jamaican Kumina Drum, highlights Queenie's interest into the world of the Kumina religion, as documented in Olive Lewin's book, Rocket Came Over, the folk music of Jamaica. Queenie recounts that while searching for coconuts in a gully, the spirits took her to a large hollow cotton tree, where she said she stayed for 21 days without food and water hanging upside down, communicating with the ancestral spirits who taught her prayers and songs in the Kikongo African language. It is from that epiphany she became a Kumina queen. Nani ho, nani kumye, yesu son wa kongrandi, yesu son wa yeme grandpa. Kumina is not something you play around with. Most people are afraid of Kumina. Because it's a high power spiritual thing. Kumina, your connection to animals, your connection to land, your connection to sky and God, but they believe that their ancestors should never be forgotten. I was once with a drummer and he was going through some rhythm patterns 
for me. And then in the middle of his demonstrating and my listening and so on, he spun up off the drum and begin, began to dance. But the drum didn't stop playing. Drum got to me and my head started going like this and I couldn't stop it. I had no control over it. There are some people in this world will never accept that they're ancestral spirits. I don't have to accept them because I can see them. Sometimes you have a spirit where you don't really want it yeah. to move with you. Now what do you do? You just sing him out. I did not see Queenie only as a, a Kumina queen. She was a healer. She was a dancer. I mean the dancer of dancing. She danced with the water on her head and she danced the whole night and one, not one tip of water would spill. She said, do, do baby, do, do mama. Once I be like, oh, the pig up, pick up, a boo, pig up, make you do, do, do. Do, do baby, yo, do, do mama, do, do. A part of dance I grew out of Kumina movements because Kumina is a lifestyle. Everything in their life calls for a Kumina session. To, to put that, 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 that seal on it, to, to bless it, to move it to the next level. So when I look at um, the dancers that come out of St. Thomas, I don't think they're afraid. And that same memory is in their body, so that's why they've come out with things like this. You know, and they've come out with, sure, and, and now they've got, they're mixing it up now with hip hop and other things and Afrobeat and everything. But the grounding of it is our African traditional folk form. There, there are certain things that we are losing. For us to be talking about Kumina, that's big, you know. That means it still exists. Who do you think keeping it alive? The ancestors. We just heard the trailer of Kumina Queen by filmmaker and cultural worker Niasha Ling. The film centers Emma Jean Queenie Kennedy who was a contemporary priestess in post-colonial Jamaica who catapulted her African spiritual practice into renown. But after centuries of erasure, what remains of the dance between the living and the dead? In the wake of the loss of her mother, Niasha traveled into the heart of the Jamaican countryside to research Kumina. The ancient practice she learns is a driving force in Jamaica's culture and identity, yet its leaders have historically been discarded as witches and criminalized. Jamaica's post-colonial renaissance enabled Queenie to share her practice with the world. Today, artists and followers are reimagining Kumina, even as the mysterious world of spirit possession reveals divergent pathways to freedom, healing, and transformation. At any other time in history, Queenie would have been discarded as a witch. For centuries, colonial laws and social taboos made her traditions of Kumina and revivalism misunderstood and feared. But the end of colonialism in Jamaica created the rare opportunity for her to share her practice on a world stage. Queenie's legacy is palpable today in Jamaican art, music, and identity. In this visually emotional film, artists, scholars, practitioners, and Niasha meditate on the values and struggles inherent in holding on to a spiritual life. Today, we present to you a conversation I had with Niasha about the film contextualize in a wider discussion about Kumina. Niasha is a documentarian who works to transform our understanding of diverse social and cultural movements and practices. Her independent storytelling, which has appeared in and on the Los Angeles Pan-African Film Festival, BBC World Service, Yes Magazine, the Art Museum of the Americas, IMZ International Festival, and European Traveling Showcase explores loss regeneration, identity, and freedom. In a statement from Niasha about the purpose of the film, she says, we tell this story to demystify and celebrate Kumina. Before the conversation, we will hear from Kamal Brathwaite presenting part of his poem, Kumina, From Born to Slow Horses, that moves with the 21 days that Imogene Kennedy, Queenie, spent communicating with the ancestral spirits who taught her prayers and songs. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and afro descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. 
Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly. Enjoy the program. On the first day of your death, it is quiet, it is dormant like a doormat. No one foot touch its welcome. Its dust on the floor is not disturbed, nor are the sleeping spirits of this house. I sit here in this chair, trying to unravel time so that it wouldn't nap and twine. On the second day of your death, I break a small bread I can still smell the sweet flower of your firstborn flesh. On the third day of your death, the water in my urine turned to blood. I cover the waterfront of the mirror with a blue cloth where your face stood. On the fourth day, you should be rising, knocking at the door of darkness, coming back to me, coming back to me. I do not hear your call. On the fifth day after your death, a young white rooster White, white, white feathery and shining tail and tall, neighbor of sun from miles away in the next village, stands in the yard and from his red crown crows and crows and will not grow away. He struts rung to the back of wall, his one eye clicking, clicking, clicking as he crows, comes to the glisten of my window and he crows loud like the overflowing voice of my Trelawney waterfall where there are no tears. Oh, mother, Margaret, Margaret, ka, ka, ka. Oh, Congo, Congo, yeri, yeri, Congo. On the sixth day after your death, there is this silence of flowers. Their petularies say their shining needs Soft water needs sweet showers, needs sweet rain from heaven. I see them once again inside the chapel of my funeral. On the seventh day after your death, the yellow flower in the cupcakes in the kitchen have gone sour. There is an eye of rancid in the middle of their meal. I am unhappy like the wind and tides are restless river divers. I can't find you, I can't find you. I cannot, cannot, cannot be consoled to rivers, dreams and divers. The mad dogs of the pasture kill the cock and pillage it. Mad woman wind is scattering white, screaming feathers, petals, petals over all the brunt and burning ochre color land. On the eighth day after your death, me do nothing, nothing, nothing. I couldn't even get your English eight spell straight. On the ninth day of your death, you rise again from off the dead. I see you now and at the hour of your old, not soft, not softly dead. It is my pain, it is my privilege, it is my own torn flesh, torn fresh. Oh, let me comfort us, my child, is not your heart is broken. On the tenth day of your death, my love, 
my sun, my shining. Oh, Yari, Yari, Yari Congo. Oh, Yari, Yari, Yari Congo. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. How are you doing? I am great. I am so excited to to talk to you, actually, and I'm really grateful for the space. And honestly, I mean, you know, this is the reason why the space is provided is to really, you know, provide a platform. I I generally do not like the the term um, um, voicelessness or provide a voice for what I don't think everybody has a voice. And I think that, you know, platforms are those particular ways to amplify those voices, but also to carry them across across distances, across time and space. So, no, thank you for for taking the time out of your busy schedule, you know, to have a conversation with us about your work, about your recent work, uh, you know, a documentary film. Talk a little bit about it, like uh, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what the what the subject matter is. Um, um, let's start there and then we'll move from specifically uh, organic conversation from there. OK, great. So so I am going to place myself quickly in Washington, D.C. on the land, I think, of the, the Anacosta. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here because um, when researching this film, it's called Kumina Queen. I got a lot of support from the Smithsonian, and um, we we know the history of of um, research institutions and um, cultural preservation orgs in this country. But I was really grateful that the woman um, who's featured in the film, who died in 1998, Queen Imogene Kennedy, had come to the Folklife Center um, and performed several times, and and some of the elder. Um, you know, archivists and, and preservationists and historians in this town um, uh, saw fit to, to work with her and, and have her meet um, audiences in DC and, and share her work and also travel around the US. So a lot of that footage is not no longer available, but it's a, the little bit of footage that there was both here and in Jamaica, um, I was able to use to, to do my research and to um, make this film ultimately. No, so let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, you know, we actually have a, a, a smaller circle. I, I, I saw that James Early actually uh, had a connection in the context of this. Let's talk a little bit about uh, it's, it's the, the pronunciation, and I'm going to make sure I get this, uh, is Kumina, correct? Yeah, or, or Kumina. Kumina, good. Talk a little bit more about that particular and uh, a subject matter, but also in the context, and we'll move into Imogene as well. Yeah, so Kumina is a folk, folk form. It's a Jamaican cultural and spiritual folk form. And I say that because it's referred to as one of, the, I think, seven folk forms in Jamaica that come from uh, African or syncretic spiritual practices. And many of them have dance and song associated with them, some of, some of which are still performed, um, maybe not widely, but publicly, like by organizations like the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica. And so there's quite an effort to preserve some of these forms, but they are dying. And Kumana is the one, one of the forms that is most, um, that has been by scholars um, associated most closely with Central Africa um, and with the, um, with the migrants from that place w during the 19th century um, as indentured servants. And so that may be one of the reasons why it was so well preserved up until, the um you know a couple of decades ago um it, it involves song dance and spirit possession and the purpose is to venerate the ancestors and let's talk a little bit more about that i mean you know it, what is interesting is is the variations and the and the ideas of spirituality that move throughout the Af from africa the continent and they basic you know they I don't like to say basically because uh, they they evolve they evolve and you mentioned syncretic you mentioned you know the 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 cultural retention of, of Africa 
you know, you talk about, you know, and this particular uh, uh, tradition, spiritual tradition comes out of the Kikanko, uh, mostly uh, people talk a little bit more about, you know, it as a tradition, its developments, uh, talk about the, uh, the syncretic nature of uh, the particular um, tradition um, tradition as well. And then we want to move specifically into Imogene. Yeah, you know, the, being sure. that, yeah. So on a surface level, because I've only learned from the scholars, um, I would say that it is a uh, it is a, a tradition that is, is primarily acquired through descent and lineage, or at least traditionally it was. Your family practiced kumina, um, and so you practiced it, or your grandmother did, maybe it skipped a generation, and then you um, learned it, just, just in the same way that we know healers often picked up the gifts of their ancestors. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but it, it, it is also, um, less syncretic in the sense that it was not practiced in the church. It was practiced in the yard and is still practiced in the yards um, in at the at nighttime, um, in the dark of night, really only because of COVID did I see um, groups um, practicing it in the daytime because of curfews in Jamaica um, during the pandemic. But yeah, so even if you didn't, um, if you weren't born into a Kumana family, you may have um, been in a community where it was practiced and you may know family members um, who, who are still practicing it and that's the way you would be exposed. Um, you would learn the songs, you would learn, of course, the, the hypnotic rhythms of, of Kumana that are, you know, those polyrhythms. And, and that's the way that a lot of people are attracted. And as we know, um, in many of many communities throughout the diaspora, drums were a way to communicate when, uh, even when banned, um, when you wanted to send a message or you wanted to gather when gathering was um, prohibited. So, so this is a really central, um, uh, a sustaining um, ritual in the community. And I like I like the fact that and, and you know I'm, it's funny because I'm 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 steeped into this this particular process is of um, um, engaged in um, community education process but also institutional education process really mapping and kind of really trying to trying to understand the synchronicity process but also the fact that a lot of the of of the form of the function of synchronicity misses the African tradition or the or the continuity of the African tradition that it it develops on its own, and and I'm and you mentioned that specifically. Could you talk a little bit more about because I'm also hearing an initiation process that goes through generation and through generation as well, carried mm -hmm. on through rhythms. You know, could you talk a little bit more about what you understand, and also. Well, well, we'll pause because I wanted to see. I, I was going to ask how you captured that, it, it you know, at the film as we start talking about the film itself. But could you talk a little bit more about your understanding of it as you're steeping yourself into this? My understanding of the initiation practices or lack thereof, right? Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Sure. Is that um, is that there is a there is a gap there? There were Kumina queens. That's the title of the film, and kings who were able to access um, spiritual knowledge. And the way they accessed it was both through the drums and through their environment. And they, um, you know, Queenie, who's the subject of the film, we'll talk more about, um, told the story that she um, went into trance at the first time at age 17 at the seat of a silk cotton tree. You know, these old trees that appear almost like uh, like giants, like humans that were believed to have housed spirits um, and ghosts of the ancestors that were believed to be a portal between the living, the world of the living and the dead, the world of the, the physical world and the world that you can't see. Um, and so she, she was able to acquire um, songs and uh, stories and um, memories that may not have been available to, to her otherwise or and not available to others. And so she went into trance again at the age of 20, 21, um, and she became a healer. But there, there was, as far as I could see, no formal practice for acquiring spiritual knowledge in, in that community, in those communities. Um, all there was was the ability to access that information. And then if you did, 
um, access that information, then you became a leader and then you were able to, um, uh, you, were, you were seen as someone who could access then what's called the, um, the duties of Kumana, which are like rules for how you should engage in the space to make sure that the spirits um, are offered what they need and that human life is also protected in the space. So you became someone who would be endowed with the ability to lead and to know those rules, um, to keep the space um, safe, and also to actually interact with the spirits with the spirits who will come into that space. And this is very important as 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 someone who looks at uh, spiritual traditions as a form of resistance as well. You know, could you could, was there any? Could you talk about the relationship, particularly? We're talking about Jamaica, of course. You know, most people who who would have uh, you know, an, I guess a medial understanding of of Jamaica would would adhere Maroonich would hear you know the processes and also the stories of of, of the different. Um, um, the disappearance, uh, uh, the appearance of the, of the Maroons and as they were attacking the, the plantation and the plantation owners and things like that, because this is a very, very important. And I want to, uh, what is interesting is, is that we often uh, uh, miss the fact that what we're talking about is a, is a, is an attempt to merge and balance seen and unseen forces, which is something that is consistent uh, in the in an African epistemic or ontological understanding of a world, right? So this is a very fascinating, you know, film that you're making and trying to really help put a material, a view on this particular practice. Uh, could you talk a little bit more or, you know, uh, correct my particular uh, understanding of what, of what no, you're attempting thank you. to do? So. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. That epistemological perspective is one that is not um, like sufficiently defined in, in contemporary culture. People, whether it's through dance, and I believe, you know, one of the tools in the film and one of the, it's not even a tool, it's just the nature of documenting a spiritual practice like this, is that you engage with the drums, you engage with song, and it is all in a call and response, that fundamental channel that is used in, um, that, that, in Afri that in many African practices is derived from that interaction between the seen and unseen. It's the call and response, because when you call, you know your ancestors are answering. So, so music and rhythm, and chanting and dance are the vehicles for us to experience and inhabit this world even that we might not be familiar with. And it is also the tools that are used um, in the practice to, to access um, a higher level of spiritual awareness, right? Um, and I think what I've found in my like many travels and, and, and like my abandoning of sort of scholarly pursuit and a desire to more fully experience the experience was that spiritual awareness um, could be found in many settings in Jamaica, can be still today. And there's an awareness and respect for um, the unseen and, the, and the, the unliving or an understanding of them as living. And I, th I think that that is what's helped to sustain a practice like Kumana, however, it's quite stigmatized, or it was quite stigmatized yeah. historically because of yeah. um, the criminalization of practices like obia throughout the Caribbean. And so there's still a need to, you know, celebrate it and to spread awareness around, around practices like this. I wanted to, I wanted to pull on one of the thoughts that you just shared, which is very important. You, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned the, the moving or abandoning uh, the academic process, and I would I would probably you know say that studying Africana ways of being and forms of knowledge is you would have to in the context of very uh, uh, in the context of very specific parameters that academia places on how we study African and Africana life, right? So. Which brings me to a very interesting, you know, not an interesting, I mean, hopefully it's interesting for our listeners, but for me, it's fascinating is the fact, what brings you to, uh, you know, 
identifying, you know, this as a as a subject for your film, but also in your answer, or we can, you know, kind of go to it. What is it that you intended or you intend or hope to do with the film itself? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think, yeah, it is necessary at some point to let go. Because when I began filming, I began it as it was the intention was was really just to um, fulfill my own curiosity. I had made a film in 2008 about Garifuna music and, and, and that touched on some aspects of the spirituality. And I wanted some sense of continuity between that and the, and the other traditions I was being exposed to. Um, traditions like Abe Mahani, which is a, a music um, that the Garifuna people, um, mainly women, there's a version that the men practice as well, um, compose songs in a dream state and also connect their in that way with their ancestors. And so I just wanted to like have a through line for myself. And um and in and in in pursuing that curiosity, I I I did at some point realize that my my understanding was limited by my biases. And uh, even it, I'm not even an academic in an academic space, and yet I could not say something like, "Okay, the spirits were present." I couldn't embody that. And and now I, I have no qualms about that. I have no, um, you know, that blurring of the physical reality and perception, um, and the unseen is not a problem for me. And I don't think it colors my work in any way. So now my intention really is to share that um, opportunity with other people, right? Because no matter what tradition we come from, everybody has a lineage and an ancestral practice where um, we, we uh, at some point in our lineage, we're open to the idea of interacting with those who came before us, right? A and honoring them. And perhaps even wanting to be heard by them and to receive messages from them in whatever form that may come. And those of us who, who have practiced some sort of art know, you know, I used to write poetry when I was like 10 and 11. And I remember um, that I used to get a feeling on the crown of my head an energy would come off and go in, like into the ether. And I would know that I had something when when I got that feeling I knew I had connected to something else um that it wasn't coming from me um and so I think yeah for artists and for other people who have not had the opportunity to engage um with with something really a, a, a sort of creative experience that leads you into that what I call a static state um this is just an invitation and I'm still inviting myself because I'm I'm still on the borderline, like trying to figure out what this means for my life. Um, but that's you know, to be fully honest, yeah. No, that and that's very important because one of the things uh, we just was engaged with. I'm, I'm I'm working, you know, with 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 some um, with some with some young scholars, and we're thinking about we're thinking literally about this very thing that you're talking about this connection, the, the creative process, and one of the questions. And this is a this is a, a age old question in the context of black artistry, of black creative production. You know, is it individualistic or, or what is the purpose of that? And one of the things that you know I was sharing, you know, with with this with this group of uh, uh, young scholars and thinkers, you know, was what you just said. You know that there's you you feel that there's something connected to something bigger than you and that and when people engage your work they can feel that too and then it's it's a continuous process um and so something like you know you know you know kumina uh akumina right uh uh in the con in the context is a vehicle is a spiritual technology that allows us to make sure that we're balancing you know, all of these particular forces that we're engaged with, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm very interested in the context of this notion of kings and queens. Uh, you know, could you talk a little bit more about that that interplay or the necessity, or uh, is there a necessity to make sure that there's a, a duality or that there's a balance? Ah, that's great. So in the discussion around kings and queens, um, I found that 
um, hmm. in speaking with practitioners, it was there was not a gender discussion of this king and queen, which was really inspiring because it suggested that the woman, um, the woman, the queen woman or queen mother's role was uh, universal and that she was able to acquire some kind of agency in holding that space. However, there is a gendered, um, uh, there is a gendered characteristic of the practice in the sense that men traditionally play the drums. Queenie was one who played her own drums. And so she broke that, um, that mold and acquired additional powers, argu arguably, right? By being able to connect with the source um, that source that connects you directly to 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 yeah um, to your ancestors and to 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 the to the non-material world really um, and also to be able to control the space through the drums because drummers have a very central role in um, in helping people to acquire that state right like to building up the anticipation and and allowing them to um, achieve some sort of um, euphoria and also bringing it down, bringing down the rhythm when it may be too much, right? For our bodies to handle. So, um, so yeah, so, so she had all of that, um, all of those abilities that she also was a healer. She was um, regarded by the um, a, a well-known revivalist uh, minister named Capo in uh, who had a church in down in um, West Kingston in the 1950s and 60s. And she performed healing rituals in that space. And so she was also known to be a revivalist um, as well as a Kumina practitioner and really became a teacher and a healer um, in broader communities outside of these, these pra practicing communities to the point where she was um, sort of adopted by the former prime minister, Edward Siaga, a controversial figure in his own right, but who had um, studied anthropology and uh, music and wanted to understand sort of one of the most powerful traditions um, that animated the rural people of Jamaica. And so he befriended Queenie and would often visit her and learn and, and learn from, from her. Um, as one more person I should mention who's a woman, and I'm getting away from the queen topic, but it's just to, it's just to say that like these women had so much power and influence, even though they were not often recognized for it. Um, yeah, there was a woman named Olive Lewin, who was really one of um, Jamaica's top foremost um, uh, uh, folklorists and also helped to found the Jamaican folk singers. And she was out there in the field documenting all sorts of music and culinary practices and stories. And so Queenie was, a, was very much um, uh, her collaborator. Which brings me to, as I was, as I was thinking about this and listening to you think, uh, think with me through this, I was thinking about talking about, could you talk a little bit about the geographical region, the role of nature or the role of the processes of, of geography in this particular place, even talking about you know, the region within which uh, the spiritual practice and technology really took a hold and where it is today. Yeah, so you mentioned the Maroons earlier and I find it fascinating. I'm always learning more about the Maroons, um, but I find it fascinating that two African nations, they were known as the Congo people essentially and the Bongo nation, I'm sorry, the Bongo nation and yeah, the Congo nation um, were adjacent. Maroons have many settlements in Western Jamaica, but also in Eastern. Well, it's three, three main settlements. And one of them um, is located in Portland, the parish of Portland in Eastern Jamaica. And so the Kumana people live in, lived in St. Thomas and in Portland. And separating the two in certain parts um, is the, are the Blue Mountains, which we know the Maroons used for refuge and also for as resources, because that's where their plant um, science, you know, was practice, right, um, from those trees. And um, so, the, so you know, so in eastern Jamaica and also on the sea, the, these people um, lived and still live and interacted and exchanged practices and, and technologies and music, some rhythms, but the rhythms still maintain, are the rhythms that are maintained today, like the Kumina rhythm is distinct and um, 
is associated with that place of origin, right? Um, and other Jamaicans, you know, have migrated and, and shared uh, the music uh, and the practices with others. And so, like I said before, it's not necessarily, um, you know, everything is dynamic and culturally evolving in our spaces. And so um, it's not necessarily restricted to one area anymore. So I'm thinking about, you know, the little bit of the jigs and this is for, you know, folk who are interested in, in, in kind of understanding, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how you came, you know, you came to this particular subject as a genealogy of, of study and, and, and discovering, you know, one's collective self uh, to the processes of one's historical and ancestral, you know, genealogies. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to kind of really talk about a little bit of the you know, just just to have a little bit of the logistics of the, the you know, where 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 are you at with the film? Uh, what do you need from the community with this film? Uh, because I know that those who are listening um, um, will be very very eager to 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 help uh, and join um, a collective process to kind of make sure that the film. Uh, reaches a, a, a an audience, a global audience, a national audience, a local audience. So, could you talk a little bit about where where you are in the in that particular processes of the film, the production? I believe the film is done. Um, however, where where are we at with that particular process? And also, and again, we'll re repeat this. How can people really support uh, the work that you're doing? Thank you so much. Yeah. So, two, so three things I want to say, and I'll and I'll end with the information about the film. One is that I'm excited to get this film back to Jamaica because that's where the practitioners live, and can provide even more insight. You know what's going on with the Kumina Kings. Um, we haven't seen a Kumina King or a Kumina Queen in in maybe a decade, but there must be someone coming up. These conversations can be had. Um, then around my lineage, I am um, a Belizean American. But when I traced my roots and I had been traveling to Jamaica for over 20 years, I discovered that, yes, my roots were also in Jamaica because many people had migrated. Um, and I was able to trace that. And then I did my DNA and I found that the specific places where those folks were from. So that was really fulfilling. And again, that, it, you know, kind of like answered that question around the connectivity. My, my, my background is Creole. Um, it's not Gairofuna, but um, it was that that inquiry about Garifuna culture that led me to, to discover this, as you mentioned, the sort of genealogical pursuits. Um, and it's that's a lifetime of learning. Um, so the film is finished. Um, and with it being finished, it needs to go out into the world. It will be um, launched in uh, internationally in September. I can't say where yet. And, but, you know, we go and we take these films around and I do believe that films like this, because, because, of, because of our desire to connect, we need to travel with them, right? We need to go to Africa, we need to go to England, we need to go to the Caribbean and right here in, um, in our metropolitan areas where folks are really interested in learning about their, their lineages, um, we need to share them. And that's my goal for the film. It also um, can be a, con a conversation starter, I, I believe, around women's roles in, in healing spaces. And, um, and I'm really excited to partner with women's organizations um, in the US to, to do that work. Um, and then finally, the help that's needed to actually launch the film, even though it's finished, is financial. So we're having a couple of screenings in the coming months here in Washington. And we do ask that people, you know, share it with others, um, come and join the screenings, whatever they can give, give. And um, if they're interested in partnering, the website will be up, kuminaqueen.net in probably a day. And then they can just send the query, say, hey, you know, my school, we are interested in screening this maybe next year after the film is launched. And we can then plan um, how this film is going to be able to engage local communities and also how we're going to finance that work. No, thank you very much. And uh, there's like so many other things that kind of popped into my mind because I'm in this space right now thinking, you know, thinking with community, but also thinking, you know, in an institutional space uh, about these particular 
these questions, these questions of uh, the role of, of spiritual technology or spirituality and, and, and the balance of energies that we receive and how to be able to balance all of those particular things. And also in, in, in the context of that, it's a necessity for us to really, in my view, to really understand these traditions uh, simply because of, I mean, there's, there's there's climate change. There's a there's a lot of things that are happening right now that uh, you know our ancestors have have provided tools and, and and for us to be able to kind of pick back up, uh, you know, and 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 protect the environment, protect each other, protect the universe in in its, in its totality. So, you know, so a film like this is very 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 important in this particular. We will do everything we possibly can to support, to screen, to do everything we can to to support you in the in the film. Um, but again, we're looking for other people, and we'll put a lot of the information um, when we when we release this out through the different platforms that we have as well. So I just want to thank you. Did you have any closing thoughts or anything that you wanted to say? Uh, per se, I always like to make sure that you, you know, um, the people are not hearing me the last. I want them to hear you <laughs> for the last. Particular. You were just so eloquent with what you just <laughs> said. So I just want to echo that um, this is just a film, right? But we are all on the path to pursue um, to pursue freedom. And freedom requires us to heal continually. And whatever tools we need, and those are connected. And if you asked me and I didn't answer to the land, to our environment, to our ancestral trajectories, like we need to pursue them. We need to pursue, and it's not just knowledge, it's it's the journey. And so I really am grateful um, to, to you for like acknowledging that because there's so many other films that are, and books uh, that are exploring these themes. And to me, it's just all an exciting, moment and movement for us who, those of us who have been practicing and those of us who have not to be able to, to, to go on this journey together. And with that being said, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. And, um, Coming from the heart of our nation, felt the rhythm of the universe and harness the vibration, translated through sound pattern. Who could deny their body the freedom of this movement? Arms in supplication to the sun, feet caress the earth. We dance balance in the universe. While captors perverted our world, we kept our souls free knowing our bodies will join us soon mekayan i know in this essence i grow kept my manhood housed in this rhythm knowing the world could never find it there unleashed it circumambulating i oman in celebration of all that she is because i knew her divinity knew she was the portal and i the key knew this world was governed by the demon of separation knew liberation depended entirely upon our connection knew our harmony had to be kept secret whispered in this symbolic code of synchronized bodies praying our children never lose this language knowing if they do the code will rediscover them and those who have ears will hear us in the rhythm calling i back to myself calling i forward to myself true i rhythm i and i preserve of harmony in the midst of destruction true i rhythm i know i self true i self i know creation <laughs>that's it for africa world now project for this week i would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week
We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNowProject at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa World Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Moisa Muntali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funa Ngonda, senior research content contributor and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior research content contributor and production associate, Dr. Josh Myers, Associate Producer and Content Contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan perry Content Contributor and Filmmaker, Kurt Orderson. Technology Advisor, it's Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology. And Creative Directors, International Creative and Artist Designer, Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. <laughs>